So hello all and thanks for joining. My name is Nate Fleming. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Bamboo Rose. Um, we're excited to have you on today for a very timely panel discussion on how a connected retail value chain can help organizations manage disruption to their operations and business strategy. I hope the conversation today will help push forward the internal discussions you're having within your own organizations or confirm some themes you're focused on in 2021 and beyond. Um, so with, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our two panelists. Um, first, Josh Jewett uh, is an industry consultant and was a Bamboo Rose client as the CIO of Family Dollar Dollar Tree for 18 years. Josh, thanks so much for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. And Tom, Tom's the Tom Backus is the director of supply chain strategy for retail and consumer goods at Microsoft with a background that includes time at both PepsiCo and Amazon. Uh, so Tom, thanks for taking the time today. Appreciate it, Nate. And of course, I've already introduced myself, uh, but quickly on Bamboo Rose, we're a multi-enterprise platform that helps retailers, brands, and manufacturers connect with their suppliers and other industry business partners to develop, source, and deliver uh, differentiating products to market at digital speed. So before we jump into our panel discussion, I wanna quickly outline some themes that we've seen from our client base and the market at Bamboo Rose over the last 12 months, as well as in conversations with Josh and Tom uh, coming into this presentation. All these themes will connect back to the conversation that Josh, Tom, and I have, um, and I hope that the questions that you submit throughout the presentation will connect with these themes as well. Um, so obviously, it, it doesn't need saying that 2020 was a year of massive change. Um, I think at the forefront of that was a lot of environmental uh, and geopolitical disruption to traditional business processes. Uh, the most obvious business story here, of course, uh, is the pandemic, but if you look beyond the pandemic, at just the last few weeks, we've seen major shipping challenges brought about by a windstorm in the Suez Canal um, and, and massive flooding in Australia. So there's no question that a variety of political, uh, cultural, and environmental um, variables can lead to increasing disruption in our modern business uh, environment. And so we're gonna talk quite a bit today about how organizations are starting to prepare for that new reality. Uh, in the same vein, we've seen uh, quite a bit of shift in terms of consumer expectations, um, both what consumers are looking to buy. We've seen upticks in leisure wear, home decor, and alcohol, um, as well as how they want to buy it, uh, which is online or curbside instead of uh, in the store as they might have in the past. Um, additionally, and I think related to especially our, our first point here, we're seeing a lot of um, interest from organizations in terms of diversifying their partner networks and the geographies in which they trade in. Um, and I think that the logic behind that is really increasing the resilience of their supply chain organization by diversifying their partner base. Um, and a lot of these organizational and business and strategic changes and consumer market changes we're seeing uh, have also led to some technology macro, tre macro trends that I'll touch on quickly. Um, so first and foremost, um, a lot of the challenges that I just outlined, I think put a lot of strain on legacy technology stacks. Uh, so organizations are growing increasingly frustrated with their disconnected siloed software systems that ultimately inhibit business agility. Uh, and I think specifically ERP tools uh, are, were a major topic this year and we'll hit on that a little bit more specifically later on. And then finally, we're seeing major concern from IT leaders around how resilient their software systems and infrastructure is. How quickly and how ably were they able to support remote work um, in the spring of last year? Um, how flexible are their systems to new business processes, new business goals, and new partners um, as they need to bring those on quickly? And I think we saw a lot of, of challenges with that, and I think we're going to see a lot of reaction to that in terms of technology strategy uh, in 2021 and beyond. Okay, um, so with that, I think we can jump into the, uh, the panel discussion with Josh and Tom. Um, so the first discussion point uh, really relates back to this, this data point you'll see here. Um, in a recent supply chain survey from Gartner, 89% of respondents indicated that supply chain agility investments were imminent over the next two years. Um, additionally, 87% indicated that supply chain resilience investments were imminent. Um, so Josh and Tom, with all the unprecedented supply chain string we've seen in the last 12 months, what steps can retail uh, business and technology leaders take to gain a better picture of their supply chain and, and minimize the impacts of these disruptions and start to bring that agility and resilience into their organization. Uh, Josh? Well, I would point out that, uh, yeah, that last year has been unprecedented, but I mean, even prior to last year, retailers were seeing a lot of pressure on their supply chains uh, just from the, 
the tariffs that were introduced uh, by the U.S. against China. And uh, that caused, at least in, in our case, that caused the merchants to do a lot of activity to diversify our, our, our sourcing uh, strategy uh, across multiple countries, right? They didn't really want to go to product quality as a to cover the cost of the tariffs, right? So they either worked directly with the supplier to address that cost structure, but it also uh, caused um, them to look broadly across multiple countries to try to get different uh, sourcing strategies and put that in place. And and it was important for our um, supply chain systems to be nimble to let them do that that sourcing and diversify that supply base across multiple countries. That came in came in handy then. And then of course in the last year, um, you know, I don't have to tell anybody on the on the webinar here that the challenges that that we've seen from uh, countries being shut down, shipments being delayed, um, receipts on the west and east coast being delayed, uh, all of that has has put a lot of pressure on on the supply chain performance and really heighten the need for visibility uh, of where things are where and where are they stuck how do we get them moving how do we address ultimately customer concerns um i would say that sort of the final dimension that that's caused us to think differently about it is uh, uh, merchants have historically flown directly to asia to um you know be eyes on the product eyes on the on the process participate really with the factories um and, and see the see the product being being uh, uh, manufactured. Well, given the travel delays, we've, we've had to think differently about that. And uh, you know, in our case, we leverage video technology uh, and other things um, that we could uh, come up with really to 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 set up the merchants to have the same level of engagement with uh, international suppliers without having to having to travel overseas. So there are a number of things that uh, we, we had to do just to to adjust to uh, the new realities of COVID, but you know, as I said at the beginning, some of these changes and, and the need to be more flexible in supply chain sourcing strategy really predates even the COVID issues we've all dealt with over the last year. Yeah, and I would, um, number one, totally echo everything that, that Josh is calling out here. Um, it, it comes up as frequent topic of conversation with, with a lot of customers today. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the lens kind of on what's going on internally with customers as well. And the way I look at it and the way I think back on my own career, operating in the space is that there's always been uh, really an inherent level of, of trust within supply chain execution for an organization. So, you know, trusting the data for by sales channels is, is fairly mature. You can understand your inventory positions to be fairly accurate, whether they're in your own warehouse or from your suppliers or downstream at store, store locations. Um, you can relatively have confidence that your suppliers are going to deliver product on time relatively consistently and that your customer demand is going to stay right in the bounds that you'd expect on the upper and lower front. Um, and by having trust in, in these key factors, it really allowed retailers and, and companies across many industries to forgo a lot of the investment in transparency or, or collaboration processes across working groups to understand really what is the end-to-end -end health of my supply chain. Um, now, it, you know, to be beyond just how do I plug into all these different parts of the value chain, uh, organizations are also going to have to figure out different ways to operate and add resiliency to, uh, you know, we expect further disruptions, right? This is whether it's the Suez or what happened with COVID, we expect disruptions to become more frequent as we move forward. So on one, one side of it, I see there's behavioral changes that you can make at the organizational level to help take immediate steps quickly. Um, you'd be surprised still today how many customers I speak with that every planning team is sitting within their own silo. Um, and they work on their own individual group KPIs without any visibility or responsibility for how this actually impacts other functions. So I'd say, you know, immediately today, starting there is an easy one. How do you standardize an SNOP process that can at least pull together the right functional leads for these groups to understand the better full picture of goals and challenges for the current planning periods? Um, but if you think about the longer term solution, I think customers need to really evaluate what are our sourcing strategies today and how do we develop the ability to better evaluate risks in the network tomorrow? Um, I think it, it's kind of dependent on the size and scope of the, uh, the business and the customer base. Um, it is likely that like risk profiling on current suppliers and evaluating sourcing from, from new geographies is going to be necessary as we move forward. I think one other thing I, I wouldn't take for granted too is how smoothly working with suppliers has been in the past and what we're going to need to expect in the future. Um, I, I don't want to beat the Suez Canal point to a uh, to a pulp here, but it's it's amazing. You know, if I think about how many customers how many of them actually with their ships hung up could quickly check with their suppliers and understand what product of theirs was actually at risk by the blockage. 
and more importantly, which customers knew how do you draw up the right plan to react and mitigate that risk with their consumers downstream. Um, so I'd, I'd say it probably takes me to the last most important step in, in gaining a better picture of one supply chain. It, it comes back to the data, right? It has to be pooled and standardized for all functions to be able to work from. We've got to get away from the idea of manual spreadsheets and version control and data being left for interpretation by different ERP systems or employees as a recipe for further risk. I, I highly recommend the centralization of critical data necessary for supply chain planning and execution tasks while investing in the right technology and solution providers that allow customers to analyze trade-offs of supply chain decisions and scenarios in the real time to make sure that in the future we're marching towards the right path. Um, and I, I want to make sure when we talk about the future, it's not just limited to supply chain planning activities. We need to be helping teams within the organization move quicker to soften the impact of disruptions across product lifecycle management, remote collaboration. All those things are incredibly critical as we move forward here. Absolutely. I think one thing that came through, getting back to that resilience point from both of you, is the, the role of collaboration technology in sort of driving that resilience. Josh, in your case, allowing merchants to maintain buying trips even when they can't go overseas uh, physically. And, and Tom, in your case, um, having collaboration tools in place to um, not just give visibility into the supply chain, but also um, give visibility across different teams that are traditionally siloed, allow them to understand uh, the data that lives within each other's uh, systems and, and business processes, but also your, your your later point on that ability to collaborate with your suppliers. So when disruption does come, you can manage it with those suppliers in real time um, as ably as possible. Um, so moving on to the next theme, uh, very much related to this, I think is really around, you know, once you've got that supply chain visibility, once you've got that, that standard set of data, as Tom just alluded to, um, how does the business start to build out the confidence and agility to act on those uh, you know, digital supply chain insights very quickly? One thing we heard from our clients uh, in the first half of last year was really they had to make decisions that they might have taken weeks or months to take in the past. They had to make those decisions in a matter of hours based on data from, from the Bamboo Rose platform. So, so what are you guys seeing in the market, um, Tom? And I think this time we'll, we'll lead with you. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and it, it's. I'm glad we're calling it out now because I think I probably oversimplified the the dramatic change we're calling out just a little bit, right? When you create these new processes or you adopt new technologies, um, thinking about the user base who has used traditional systems or ERP tools for years and years, and you give them this new set to work with, there's a ton of apprehension about how do I use these to execute the vision of what I understand? And there's a, there can be mistrust around the data, the outputs, the end results. You think you can do it better if you stay with the way that you know. Um, but it, you know what I've seen, especially transitioning between a couple of different organizations and partnering with uh, different technology providers over the last couple of years, the advancements really in the last five to 10 years with cloud-based and AI enhanced solutions has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it starts at the top with company leaders. When you can buy into the value prop and understanding of these solutions that they will actually give, give you the improved supply chain insights you're looking for and become the active sponsor of embracing these new capabilities, it goes a long way to getting the entire supply chain organization of practitioners to actually go ahead and execute the vision. Um, it's really critical during the implementation phase that operational stakeholders understand clear direction and training on how to leverage new views that they have into the existing value chain. I've, I've been a part of a lot of projects where we, we bring in new technology solutions, but we don't do enough robust training around it and give enough kind of legwork and, and support to be able to actually see how it's used. And you see people slip backwards to, to relying on what they know. Um, so it, it, there's a ton of work that needs to go on in the underlying side of how do you map and understand how these new tools are going to layer on top of legacy systems like ERP is already in place. Um, I, I think that one thing I call out is, you know, as an example, if you think about forecasts that you would send to suppliers month in advance or material purchasing recommendations being made on a new platform, if it doesn't sync with the existing systems that are used on a daily transactional basis, um, it's critical to have bridges to integrate existing tools that provide confidence to the teams running the core uh, components of the decisions being made. Um, but I, you know, I, I will say, um, and Josh, I'll, after this, I'll give it to you, but even with all this preparation, you, you still see customers drag feet on implementation um, and actually trust the, the recommendations from new tools given the, the razor thin margins for error that we live in within the supply chain world. Um, over to you, Josh. Yeah, I would think it, it does um, set the stage for beginning to think differently about the problem, right? I mean, for for 20 plus years, I mean, retailers have been really trying to do, understand the demand side of, of the equation and really try to be sure they got the right product in the right place at the right time. But the new insights that, that you're getting into the total end-to-end -end supply chain visibility also give you the, the potential to start to look at 
at, at sourcing issues, right? So now that you have a better handle on demand, are you going to be able to actually meet that demand, right? And and how how do you flow the product in from overseas? How do you buy it? How do you you know how do you pace it? How do you how do you flow it? How do you be sure that you can actually satisfy that demand? That's not something that that is, has been possible from an end-to-end -end perspective in the past. So I do think the visibility, while while it presents a lot of challenges that you talked about, it also presents new opportunities that, that retailers can take advantage of um, that they've not been able to do in the past. Absolutely. Great. Um, so the next the next theme we'll move on to uh, focuses a little bit more on, on some specific systems as I alluded to uh, early on in the presentation. So uh, based on a recent Gartner survey uh, in collaboration with CFO Dive, 64% of uh, respondents indicated that they'd consider cloud ERP a top investment target by 2024. Uh, and I thought that was interesting, well ahead of some technologies we've heard quite a bit about over the last several years, uh, like artificial intelligence and blockchain. Um, I think this exposes the pain that many organizations felt around their legacy ERP systems amidst the last uh, 12, year, 12 months and all the changes they had to make during that time. Um, but for many organizations, obviously, you know, completely ripping out their ERP or completely transitioning over to a cloud ERP um, might not be in, in their roadmap. Um, you know, that might be a little aggressive for them. Um, and additionally, even with this data, um, 2024 is, is still three years away. Um, so in the meantime, uh, how can retailers ensure that they're remaining responsive and flexible to changing markets despite some legacy systems that might um, hamstring them or slow them down? You know, what, what steps can they take? Um, and Tom, I'll, uh, I'll let you lead off on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's again, this is, you know, a struggle that, that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I think back over the past 15 years, you know, the internal meetings, external meetings with partners and vendors, there's always groups from supply chain planning, sales, marketing, finance. Um, and it, it, it was always, you know, a question of in the beginning, it, we couldn't even figure out who's on first, right? We're just, we spend so much time trying to validate data we're using for analysis and make sure it matches across all different functions and planning horizons. And then being able to share it in an effective manner with collaborative groups, it was it's it's a nightmare. Um, and that's where, you know, speaking of solution providers like Bamboo Rose and, and other SaaS tools that are out there, um, it, it helps us be able to recognize the gaps and pain points and the design and the way these offerings are built helps meet customers where they are so that that data is much more accessible, regardless of, of leveraging kind of ERP legacy tools. Right. Um, it, it doesn't. The way I look at it is that it's these solutions are built so that it's not helping one group like buyers or production planners or fulfillment groups, all functions become able to kind of access this data and interpret it more easily, um, which, you know, it, it's a great starting point, but it's something we've been clamoring for for decades. So it's, it's only getting us so far. Um, now it really becomes that the next step is the evolution of layering intelligence on top of the data interpretation that you're doing, right? So help help the users get guided to the right most pertinent data to make fast important effective decisions um if you think of suez or, or a different disruption example you have is a real-time example can i leverage a tool that would help me scrape all ships in the current log jam determine how many ships are going to be rerouted and when the canal will be operating back at 100 percent capacity to better predict how many future po disruptions i can expect along this lane and, and react accordingly. That, that's what customers want to see in the end state, right? And that's that's where we need to get to and it's helped by these SaaS solutions that can layer on top of existing technologies. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I, I'd echo the point about the benefits of, of SaaS solutions along the continuum, right? So that you can, whether it's Bamboo Rose or other solutions that you might consider later down, down in the supply chain, uh, Optimizing the flow of products, you know, you can you can have a real big impact even if you are tied down with some traditional ERP systems. That generally speaking, the uh, SaaS solutions will be something that that can plug into legacy infrastructures that most are designed to be able to do that to augment or replace certain steps in the workflow, optimize certain outcomes and and processes, and and perhaps produce visibility into, into data which historically the, the enterprise has not had. Uh, in that in that particular process, whatever it might be, uh, um, and I would also echo the point that that abstracting and pulling the data out of systems and putting it in an environment where it can be uh, open for collective um, access and analysis and in a secure fashion is is definitely the way to go as well. You know, you're you're hearing about a lot of companies creating a a data lake environment uh, in Azure 
where they can then um, apply uh, tools and analytics on top of it and use some of the native capabilities in that environment to begin to draw some insights across a lot of different disparate systems. And I think those are some of the ways that you can work around um, both the uh, limitations potentially of, you, of your existing legacy systems, but also give you allow you to add value incrementally while you're making some of the bigger, harder, um, time-consuming and expensive changes to, to your core ERP system. So you can sort of walk and chew gum at the same time and, and spin off incremental value for the business while you're doing some of the heavy lifting inside inside the ERP suite to upgrade it or move it to the cloud or whatever is the right end-stage vision for, for your company. Yeah, Josh, I think that's a good point. We see a lot of our clients who just want to layer bamboo rows on top of the ERP and then um, collaborate on orders um, before they commit, uh, you know, make changes to orders, uh, get feedback from suppliers and orders before they do that commitment in the ERP. And that, that just that little capability gives them a lot of value. Um, Tom, I brought you thought you brought up some really good points. Um, you know, we often see uh, around historic data and, and how this this incident in the Middle East right now uh, will be kind of very uh, valuable for future incidents in the same geography. Um, we often find that ironically that the data that lives within some of these legacy systems is ultimately kind of the engine um, for some of the artificial intelligence efforts that you see down the road. So while they are um, slow, the data that lives inside can be really valuable in certain use cases. Great. Um, so moving along, um, you know, now we're, I think, going to talk a little bit more about uh, the consumer market. Um, and I think everyone knows that over the last 12 months, we've seen a major uptick in terms of consumer spending online. Uh, this, this data from Deloitte shows that now more than 40% of total consumer spending is happening online. And, and that's a huge shift for so many retailers um, who are really built and designed to sell most of their product in stores and really maximize profits through that channel. Um, so how do you see the recent surge in customer expectations around new buying channels uh, like buy online, pick up in store and home delivery uh, impacting that supply chain strategy, that first 10,000 miles. Uh, Josh, do you want to lead off on this one? Well, sure. I think the first thing I, I would say is um, it's tough to have a crystal ball to know exactly what's going to shake out in terms of customer demand patterns. Ultimately, um, I think one thing you know for sure is that some of the new um, conveniences that have been added, you know, to like Bopus and, and, and so forth that have been added by retailers to customers are not going to go away, right? So customers enjoy the convenience of that. And I think that does definitely change the customer demand pattern. And I also, across the portfolio, you see different categories have, have, have really held up strong during, during the, the and certain, certain retailers as well during dealing with COVID. And some of that is unlikely to change as well, right? There's been a lot more spending on, on durable goods, a lot more um, uh, uh, spending on shipment, uh, direct to consumer. I don't think some that that's the kind of thing is gonna go away. So I think retailers are gonna have to get used to creating a supply chain and a nimbleness in their supply chain to be sure that they can deliver product either direct from source or from a, a 3PL or potentially from source consumers. Uh, in ways that, that historically had not had to do before. And I think that will, because that will change, the customer demand pattern will change. I think supply chains have to be responsive to that and to be sure that the product is available um, in different nodes along that supply chain than historically they've had to, they've had to worry about. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm in agreement with Josh. I, you know, I don't think anyone can accurately or confidently say this is what the long-term state will be. I think it's going to be, you know, multiple factors ab about the consumer base for an individual customer, um, who they service, how their behavior is going to change for what they want in the future um, is going to dictate some of it. A lot of it will also be determined by, you know, how quickly do customers figure out what is the right service model that they need to support the business and what is the investment going to take to get there. Um, I think the, one of the most extreme examples I've seen is that, you know, McKinsey data last year, I remember a webinar around, um, I think, pick up grocery, obviously, as an essential good. It, it was something that was still being purchased heavily and uh, upwards of 70 percent of transactions um, in specific regions were, were done by, by BOPIS. Right. Um, and that's that's obviously heavily driven by the restrictions in store engagement. But there was stickiness to that purchasing behavior. I, I know that, you know, the grocery industry last year pre-COVID uh, and the years before was still single digits. 
Um, and now the talk is that this is accelerated BOPIS strategy for by, by possibly 10 years, and it's going to be something like 25% is still buy online, pick up and store when we're past this, right? So we have pushed forward this existential question of, of who do we want to be and who do our consumers dictate that we need to be. Um, and we should expect that, right? It's forced consumers to get more comfortable with these online models. It's helped push people away from the idea that you need to try before you buy mentality. Um, and now they, they understand that, you know, customers are like meeting the retailers are going to find ways to meet them on their terms, um, which is really unfortunate for supply chains because they're built for uh, mass truckload moves. They're built for efficiencies. They have these huge mega DCs that are in the middle of nowhere. Um, they've got suppliers and, and lead times that have all been built and stretched out to maximize for cost savings and efficiencies, right? Um, and that now when you think about the e-commerce growth and how much online engagement there is, you've got millions of units within uh, an organization supply chain that really aren't set up to support a customer supply chain, right? They're, they're just not in the right locations. Um, consumers, you know, they don't... <laughs> We don't want to have product that you have to pull from a warehouse, then you put on a full truck that's in a pallet, then you break that pallet down, then you stock it on a shelf, then the customer puts it in their cart. Um, that's the traditional way of shopping, but consumers are looking for how to, it, I just want it to come to me. I want the perfect packaging with it. I want it at my doorstep. Um, so the, the last mile challenge that Josh has, has alluded to that we all know, they're, they're there um, and it's creating tremendous strain on cost speed and fulfillment capabilities. Um, and even a few years ago, right, today was a, something that it sounded like it was great to have from Amazon. Now today is kind of table stakes to even be in the conversation. And it's even same sub same day, two hour delivery that people are looking for, right? Um, and on top of that, customers want things like if they make a mess up on their order, they understand that in, in the past they understood that, okay, well, when it comes, I'll have to return something. Now it's like, no, I, I actually want to be able to interrupt this in the live stream um, and be able to tweak my order before it ships out the door. Um, which all seems so simple on the consumer facing side, right? But there's really a, a tremendous impact on the back end tech and supply chain network strategy and fulfillment uh, implications. So there's going to be, um, you know, a surge, continued surge around micro fulfillment centers, third party logistics partners um, in the near future. But I'm really interested to see that, you know, that regardless the strain on the technology and supply chain infrastructure is there and companies are going to have to come to, come to uh, a decision on what that really strategic path forward is going to look like. And I, I, candidly, I'd say that most customers still don't have this multi-node distribution figured out, but it's it's one of the biggest questions that we're talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. We were we were thrilled to hear from our client, American Eagle, that they were able to kind of leverage visibility on our platform and understanding of, of where inventory was in the supply chain uh, to start to leverage some of their uh, stores as, as, as micro uh, fulfillment centers um, as they realized that so much of their um, sales were going to shift to digital in Q2 and Q3 of last year. Um, I think one other interesting point here is we think a lot about, you know, how does Bopis impact um, store strategy and, and the store structure and kind of bringing more of that distribution center to the store. But I think another interesting thought, especially in grocery, is how does it impact the product itself? Um, the format you're buying product in, um, the packaging you're buying product in, I think a lot of those things could change as the way that we buy products shifts. Um, and it actually segues well to our next uh, topic here, environmental social governance, because I think, um, you know, first, in, in, in a, from a packaging perspective, there's going to be opportunities to, you know, streamline packaging and make that more sensitive to environmental impact with more uh, buying online uh, and, you know, home delivery or picking it up curbside. Uh, but also, um, Tom and Josh, some of the themes you alluded to about, you know, how our supply chains have been architected for the last uh several decades around uh you know reliance on distribution centers and, and and store sales and now you know what's the environmental impact of our supply chain is going to be as as we really shift to much more of a home delivery and convenience model and and how can we avoid taking steps back um, in terms of emissions impacts and sort of supply chain efficiency while still standing up these new consumer expectations um because ironically consumer expectations are also that retailers and brands um take more ownership over their environmental impact. And so um, that, again, sort of segues to this, this final uh, kind of discussion point here where, uh, you know, we have this quote this time from a stakeholder named Newt Hans uh, out of the Institute for Management and Development, um, who found that, you know, 90% of executives understand the importance of sustainability and, and believe in that, but only 60% of companies are incorporating that into their strategy and only 25% are incorporating it into their business model. Um, so how are you starting to see 
enterprise retailers and brands, um, you know, react to that consumer pressure? Um, you know, what steps are they taking? Uh, how does it connect back to their technology strategy? Josh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you first. Yeah, so I, I think in most cases, folks are going to build on a foundation they, they've already put into place, right? So uh, not so long ago, uh, there had, had been a lot of concerns about um, the raw materials that go into the products that you manufacture, everything from concern about lead paint and toys uh, to other tainted product like that, but also the nutritional content and country of origin of suppliers. So retailers of um, and CPG companies have had to get more sophisticated at understanding the sourcing and the sourcing of, of the components of what they source um, significantly earlier in the supply chain and have built, built tools to assure that. And then in recent years, social compliance has become um, equally important and understanding the method of production and distribution of your product from, from the country of origin and be sure that, that that sustains ethical practices. Once again, they've had to uh, pick uh, testing partners. They've had to do more on-site inspections. There's been technology built around collecting and facilitating and sharing that uh, that information across trading partners and, and, and being sure you have it for, for, for the government if need be. And, and, and likewise, I mean, if we go back 20 years, uh, DOT changed a lot of what many what importers needed to supply to the Department of Transportation in, in terms of import uh, compliance and where things were coming from and, and so forth. So there's been more and more and more pressure, both from the consumers and government, uh, for a lot of reasons on on sourcing strategies. I think sustainability pressure will will feel very similar to that in some ways. I think you put your finger on it. It's a lot of it's going to go on the packaging. The nature of the packaging is the packaging comprised of sustainable materials. Is it using plastics? Um, how much cardboard is it using? You know, because cardboard itself is a concern from a disposal side at the other end when it gets to the store. So I think there's going to be a lot of activity on the packaging and the way the product is is shipped uh, to the U.S. And then I think the micro fulfillment you're seeing Amazon and uh, and, and go quite publicly with its commitment to electric delivery vehicles, uh, fleets, and so forth. So I think you're going to see a lot of pressure on the way things are distributed through through either partner, you know, so, uh, retailer partnerships, or or if the retailers themselves engage in the in the practices, how how are they doing it in, in ways that can can be more sustainable and and lower their overall carbon footprint? Using that example. Yeah, I would. Um, I, I agree with Josh on, on these points as well. I, I think it's it's interesting, right? Where there's there's been a ton, especially from from the leader enterprise retailers in these spaces of of awareness and and effort, and investment, and energy over the past couple decades. Um, but in relative terms, I, I still think of it as early days, both in terms of where technology is and how strategies are actually formed. I I, I struggle to look you know, across the global landscape and say, this is someone who's figured it out and this is how we emulate what they've done, right? Um, that doesn't mean to say that, you know, retailers or brands are not acknowledging what their heightened level of responsibility looks like today. Um, and it, while, you know, retailers and consumers are, are driving the initiatives and kind of the onus at this point, um, regulation from what we've seen is, is not far behind and it's gonna become a real significant catalyst towards transformation. Um, and that's where it, it takes, it's great to see the groups that are being stood up internally and the partner groups that we're seeing built um, out there in the industry because business technology is, is going to be um, what helps companies not become caught off guard, right? I think that it's, it's going to take investment and thought leadership, identifying the right talent and partners in the space because trying to, to build these things out internally clearly hasn't worked to this point. Um, and it's it's going to turn it from something that is you know the cost of doing business to a competitive advantage will take a, a deep level of, of partnership and collaboration. So um, I, I think the monumental challenge I look at is um, everything needs to be done more effectively, right? When you think about just organic population growth over the next 15 years and the th theoretically adding you know 1.82 billion people to, to the Earth's population, um, you need to find ways to be able to to run businesses more efficiently, and that's where this it's it's kind of running a parallel path to everything you expect right i want to deliver product more efficiently whether it's something like electric vehicles or less times touching the product itself um, i want to use less packaging um, which technology is helping to aid with more stable and, and less plastic used things like that 
and and forecasting techniques where you know the the most wasteful thing we can do is is build some or manufacture something that is actually never sold. So as consumers get customers get smarter about building their forecasts and and consumers are more in tune with it, um, it, it puts us in a better space to make uh, the most of everything that we produce and put on the market. Absolutely makes sense. I agree, uh, Tom, on the regulation point. I think uh, for especially our food clients that we talk to, one of the major drivers of investment is regulations they see coming in the next three, five, ten years that they'll have to adhere to. If they know they're not they're not ready to yet. Um, and Josh, relating to some of your points, I think um, you know we've seen a lot a lot of monitoring of where the product's coming from, what's in the product, and I think the next stage is sort of um, all right. How is the product disposed of? You know, in terms of what's in the product, how how much uh, you know, who who does it who does the uh, pressure lie on to dispose of that product? Is it the consumer? Uh, is it a government body, or is it the the original uh, seller or manufacturer of the product? And I think that's something I'm hearing more and more about um, in, in the market today. Uh, so so listen, guys, great great points on these uh, discussions. I really appreciate your input. I'm going to jump to um, some key takeaways here, uh, just to summarize for the audience, and then we're going to go to a Q&A. So I just want to remind uh, everyone on the line today to please feel free to input your questions um, in the questions uh, link on the right side of your screen, um, and, and we'll get to them uh, just after this slide. But first, uh, just some key takeaways. Uh, you know, first, we, we see disruption to uh, supply chain status quo continuing, uh, but we see some consumer behaviors uh, reverting. So some of the new uh, activities and behaviors and expectations we've seen emerge in 2020 and this, the first half of 2021, I think will continue, but some will also fade away um, as life uh, returns to normal a little bit. So it will be interesting to monitor um, what consumer expectations change uh, and stay changed and what consumer expectations maybe shift back. Um, another key takeaway from my perspective is, is the supply chain is a differentiator. Um, as we think more about uh, online sales and buy online, pick up in store, and the speed to which you can meet the needs of consumers and anticipate the needs of consumers. The supply chain goes, I think, from something that is an opportunity for efficiency and cost savings um, to something that can really differentiate you from, from your competitors and help you win uh, market share. Um, the third piece is really, as these new technologies um, come, in, uh, come into implementation and come into place, Organizations must be ready and must have the, I think, uh, Tom, as you alluded to, the training and the ownership from the executive level to get everyone involved to buy into this data and leverage this data confidently. And that will be huge for success um, of these new uh, SaaS tools that we're seeing being implemented today. Um, as we hit on uh, this fourth key takeaway, uh, while legacy systems might slow you down, they are valuable data stores. Um, for uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning efforts, and whether they stay in the legacy system or they go into a data lake, um, there's huge opportunity in that historic data, um, especially from events like the one we saw over the last couple of weeks um, in Egypt. Um, fifth uh, uh, and sixth, we see early consumer uh, ESG efforts um, and ESG interest, but, but the real change will come with regulations that are are not far behind. So. Um, I do think that we've already seen new regulations relating to a lot of these ESG and sustainability efforts being implemented, and we'll see more of that uh, in the coming years for sure. And that will that will really drive a lot of strategies as we're already starting to see. Great. Um, so moving on to some questions here, um, it looks like we have a couple in from the audience. Um, the first one uh, is um, I'll let you guys decide who wants to take this. Um, how much do you see technologies like QR codes being used for traceability efforts across the supply chain? Um, <clears throat> so jo Josh, I can start on that one and feel free to jump in. So uh, interesting question. Um, I think that it, it's a it's a scale one for me um, in terms of how what what data is actually being gleaned from the codes um, to actually d drive some intelligent decision making, whether it's around uh, you know, information about the product itself, uh, inventory positioning, inventory quality and condition. Um, there's a, a couple partners out there that I've seen have some some pretty ac interesting application for it. Um, but the the challenge is in ingesting the the wide array of information to be able to interpret. So um, ultimately, it's it's another tool for traceability, and I think it has applicability. I'm just not sure if it 
if it makes sense for every customer use case that we've seen out there. Yeah, yeah, I'd add to that. I think it, I think it's in its infancy stage, right? To figure out where and how to use it, right? I mean, the most common use cases you see today is it's just it's information for the consumer on, on, on the product, right? It, it, they scan the QR code and it jumps out to a website that gives them more information that could be supplied on the packaging. Now, whether that could be leveraged as a source for real-time updates of inventory, inventory or or uh, traceability uh, uh, information is is an interesting concept. I'm not seeing a lot of people do much with that, at least the, the, the retailers I've been working with. And but you do bring up a good point, Josh, about the idea that if you, what you can scan from a QR code and, and how, as more people have the mobile application and, and accessibility, um, that plays right into sustainable packaging, right? And, and what is printed on these things and, and what kind of instructions and things need to actually be in the box and what can you reduce if you have something that they can tap into through a QR code. That's right. Reverse logistics, you know, proper disposal. Somebody can come pick it up. You know, there's a lot of things you can do um, with that kind of uh, hook into the consumer interaction. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, the next question, I think, is for you, Tom. Um, there's been a lot of talk on this webinar about process and technology steps firms can take uh, to manage disruption. Um, I think they're curious what the role Microsoft Azure can play in enabling some of these technologies uh, from an infrastructure perspective? Yeah, good question. Um, you, you know, after the, the majority of my career was spent uh, leveraging on-prem services and capabilities, uh, Azure to me is, is really going back to that point about being an accelerator to help meet customers where they are in their journey, right? So just like the idea that you can leverage SaaS to layer on top of existing capabilities, there doesn't need to be a direct correlation of I can only be on-prem or I can only be in the cloud, and that's that's how I need to leverage all my operations and services. There, there's kind of those hybrid models that you can look at. You can port over specific things. Um, you can translate data back and forth uh, to on-prem capabilities. We've we've worked with customers right where you take tremendous data from them, are able to bring it to the cloud, run some really cool analytics on it, and then spit them back out solutions that they can ingest right back into their on-prem capabilities. So. I think that it goes without saying there's a tremendous amount of value to having cloud-based data and services and being able to kind of democratize access for information to a, a much larger portion of your organization as you see fit and help them leverage more powerful analytical capabilities and, and collaborative tools right off the bat. Um, as I look to just the new age of supply chain capabilities, applications, APIs, most of them, if not all of them, really born in the cloud. Um, and Azure becomes kind of one of those domains where you can collaborate openly with these new partners and services to accelerate your time to value and, and ability to drive your change faster within your organization. Yeah, I, I agree with everything uh, you've said. Um, I mean, in, in my experience, it, it you know it gives you speed to market and creates an environment where you can pull in disparate data from a, a lot of of different ancillary systems, both on and off prem. It creates a, a great environment for you to do um, analytics, proof of concept. Uh, you don't have to worry so much about the scalability. Um, you know, it's sort of you have instant processing power. Uh, it's just a great, great environment for you to to figure things out and explore what what you could possibly do in, inside your core enterprise platform. So I think it, it's quite useful in that way. Great. Um, and Josh, I think we've had one that just came in for you. Um, in your experience as a CIO. Uh, given this discussion we've had today around kind of data visibility and, and knocking down silos, um, you know, how did your system integration strategy evolve um, as your technology organization matured? Yeah, I, you know, it's it it's a that's a tough question to answer, right? Because you you you've got you know as an established company that's been around for and obviously some of the systems that that. My team and I were responsible for predated my time with the company, and 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 I'd been there 18 years. Um, you have to sort of deal with uh, the ground you have. Very few things are greenfield, so I think you're constantly trying to move the platforms forward, advance capabilities. And I mentioned earlier, you know, supplementing those core capabilities with point solutions around the way, whether they be optimization solutions, analytics solutions, uh, in some cases, transactional systems that, that give you the capabilities you want. So I, th I think our strategy evolved with industry capabilities, and we were not a, a dissimilar from other companies in that we had legacy systems to contend with. And 
So we were able to, to figure out how to supplement those capabilities with uh, bolt-ons, third parties, the SaaS solutions I mentioned earlier, as well as some, some analytics capabilities to, to satisfy um, new demands that came up along the way while we continue to modernize the, the platforms as best we could. Makes sense, absolutely. Um, and then a, a question on sustainability has come in. Um, what retail categories will be the, the first impacted by these impending regulations? Um, and I think uh, very related to that, who is the most vulnerable uh, in terms of retail categories to these regulations? Um, I, Josh, I'll go first and, and feel free to, to add as well. I, the, for me, the way I look at it, it, it's a little speculative, right? We don't we don't know exactly what's going to come down first, where where all the momentum is coming from. We think we have a good idea, um, but it, it's a volume game to me in, in the category. So I think about how resource intensive the apparel industry is, um, whether it's the water required to make a cotton t-shirt is, is tremendous, the dyes that are used, um, the stretched out sourcing network from where the product is produced, um, where it can be kind of semi-finished and, and where it actually is ultimately shipped to and sold. Um, there's a there's a tremendous global strain that I see there. Um, the food and beverage would probably be the other one I call out just from a, not only the production, the mass production standpoint and all the packaging associated, but when you think about, um, especially in developing regions, the amount of waste uh, that goes into harvesting um, and, and what resources are all required and, and all other industries dependent on, on food production. Um, it, it's kind of, a, you know, the urgency around sustainability says, where are we gonna get the most bang for our buck with regulations? Um, and I, I think these are, these are two subcomponents that are, are gonna be dramatically impacted in the next five, 10, 15 years. Yeah, I, I keep coming back to packaging, right? Tom mentioned packaging yep. as well. I think that's the most direct manifestation in the eyes of the consumer to, you know, their their personal impact on sustainability or what it what you know when they get the when they get the good or they get the garment or they whatever it is they've they've received. What kind of packaging does it come in? And I know in my in my own life I've seen Amazon's packaging evolve over the last mm -hmm. year. Um, what you used to get from uh, Whole Foods or what you got from, uh, you know, Prime, it's it's packaged differently today in different materials than it was uh, just just a year ago. So I think companies are beginning to become more nimble in the in the packaging, and you're seeing more recyclables used in this in this packaging that comes in less plastics, less bubble wrap, uh, things like that. I think I think that's going to play out a lot over the next few years. I I don't know that a lot of small to medium size, and this could even be multi-billion dollar organizations, really have that kind of packaging expertise in-house. I think a lot of them are either relying on the factory or they're bringing in consulting resources to help them do it. I think you're gonna see um, uh, companies evolve that discipline uh, to, to package it. And then there's other benefits as well, right? You're optimizing the cube on your inbound shipment. You, you may be burning less, uh, burning less gas uh, and transportation miles to, to get product to, to the consumer or to your own facilities. I mean, there's sort of second and third tier economic benefits that, that justify it, but it's sort of the sustainability pushes, I think, are going to be the, the nudge that a lot of organizations need to get more sophisticated in this space. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I see a lot of interest from clients in the market around packaging and, and streamlining that process. And understanding what you know what materials are within packaging and tracking that almost it's the same as you do the product itself uh, in the food space um, another one that i hear a lot for food food clients or food prospects is, is traceability and and increasing expectations for different governments about understanding deeper and deeper into that supply chain um, you know factories line levels ingredient sources all those things so that, that's one i've heard as well um, so it looks like that uh, wraps up the questions today um, Josh and Tom, I can't thank you enough for participating. Uh, really great input and ideas. Uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise, appreciate it. And, and for all those that joined, uh, thank you for your attention and interest. We really appreciate it. If you wanna learn more, uh, please feel free to uh, find us on, on email or on social channels. Uh, so thank you all for joining very much.